This episode is brought to you by Goalie. Did you know the University of Michigan did a study that found over 80% of apps for kids are designed to lure them into longer gameplay and more in-app purchases? Goalie decided it was time for this to end. Unlike the Kindle and iPad that have endless ads and potentially dangerous content, Goalie is a tablet with only apps that build independent kids. It has no web browser, no social media, and no ads, ever. It has award-winning learning apps like Khan Academy, Duolingo ABC, and Starfall, and the best part? It's completely parent-controlled. In my house, we use Goalie's kids calendar to teach my son how to stay on task. He learns life skills like how to make a sandwich by watching one of the hundreds of video classes and can practice it by following along with one of the 50 pre-made routines. As a dad, there's no better feeling than knowing that my son is becoming more independent every day. For more information and to try Goalie risk-free for 30 days, visit getgoalie.com. That's G-E-T-G-O-A-L-L-Y.com and use the code the Autism Dad to save 10%. Welcome to the Autism Dad Podcast. I'm Rob Gorski. Thank you all for taking the time to be here. I really appreciate it. If you're a returning listener, thank you so much. I really appreciate you. And if you're new to the show, welcome. I'm so glad you're here. Uh, we're going to have a really fascinating conversation today. My guest is Dr. Susan Go, and she is a pediatric neurologist as well as a behavioral analyst. And I just find this combination fascinating. And we're going to have a conversation about comorbid diagnoses that go along with autism. We're going to talk a little bit about like the diagnostic process and some of the challenges and, and that kind of thing. And uh, I think it's really interesting, especially if you're new to the diagnosis or if you're looking at getting your kid evaluated for something like this. So thank you, Dr. Go, for taking the time to be here. I really appreciate it. If you could take a moment and introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about who you are and your background and uh, let's have a conversation. I'm, I'm really excited to hear from you. Sure. Thank you, Rob. I'm so happy to be here with you. Uh, my name is Suzanne Go. I am a pediatric neurologist and a behavior analyst, and I'm a practicing physician in San Diego, California. And my area of passion and interest um, and experience is autism. So uh, really, my practice is focused on that, and um, I've had the privilege of working with a team, and we, we now provide autism uh, care services around the country in 24 centers called Cortica. Really? That's really cool. Um, I have, I have, I have quite a few questions and, and we're going to sort of focus on, um, like comorbid diagnoses with autism today. Cause there's a lot of confusion, I think, surrounding that with parents. Um, but I wanted to ask you a couple of questions. So being a developmental neurologist, uh, right, you said developmental neurologist, right? Pediatric neurologist. Pediatric mm -hmm. neurologist. Okay. Do you, do you find that there is like a shortage of people doing what you do? Yes. If that makes sense? Yes. There is a, there's a, a real shortage. And really, there, there always has been. Things are getting better. There are, there are more professionals entering the field, both physicians and also therapists and mental health professionals. But really, there still aren't enough. Um, in fact, there's some research showing that there's an 18-fold greater uh, demand and need for services than there are professionals to provide those services. So what role would a pediatric neurologist play in the diagnosis of, you know, a child that is presenting with, you know, symptoms of autism? Yes. So pediatric neurologists vary a lot in terms of their specialization. So pediatric neurologists like me who specialize in uh, what we call cognitive and behavioral neurology uh, do a uh, provide a, a whole host of services that can be very helpful for autism. Some of us do diagnostic evaluations and can provide those diagnoses. Uh, most can if they, uh, if they specialize in behavioral neurology. Um, but often, you know, child psychiatrists or psychologists also have an important role to play in diagnosis. The part that pediatric neurologists um, can really, you know, my own practice is quite broad because of my interest in autism. Um, so most pediatric neurologists don't do the whole range of support and care for co-occurring uh, or comorbid conditions. We can talk more about those. Um, 
But all of them will do things like genetic testing. Um, they'll do some level of metabolic testing. Uh, and then where they really have expertise is in epilepsy diagnosis and management. And we know that's really important in autism because about 20% of autistic children have epilepsy and then a much higher number, somewhere around 40 to 50% will have unusual findings on an EEG, on an electroencephalogram that actually are important to know about and might inform treatment decisions. That is two of my three kids, actually. <laughs> uh, I have one who is, my oldest was diagnosed with epilepsy, like much later in life. He's 24 now, but he was diagnosed about 15 years ago. So he was 10 or 11. Um, and then my youngest or my, my middle child, he's 18 now. He, he tested, they didn't diagnose him with epilepsy, but they said like all the pieces are in place. Like, um, we just haven't had any, any seizure activity or any, mm -hmm. you know, irregular electrical activity, but they said like the, like the, I forget how they described it as like a four way stop or something where there was just, um, like it was just like, like the, the roadway is there, but he's not having issues, I guess, if that makes sense. Yes. I don't yes. think I described that right. They, they likely saw something on an EEG that, that showed the parts of his brain may be prone to having seizures, but he wasn't having seizures yet or at, at that time or, or, um, so yeah, so we can, an EEG is a great test because it measures the brain's electrical activity and can show us signs of maybe, you know, what parts of the brain are firing in unusual ways, how that might be affecting the way a child thinks and learns and behaves, um, and then guide us to, towards steps that we could take to help. Do you, so I've, I've never met someone in your profession and we've worked with pediatric neurology and developmental neurologists and pediatric psychiatrist, all, all that, all that stuff. Um, I've never met somebody who specializes in both the, the neurological side and is also a BCBA. And that is really interesting to me. That was one of the things that really stuck out, um, when we we got connected because there seems like there would be so much positive overlap in, in helping you to understand how one impacts the other. And I was just wondering if you could kind of talk a little bit about how that sort of helps you to, you know, better uh, impact the lives of, of kids that are, you know, dealing with something like autism? I really appreciate the question. It makes such a big difference. And I hope that more and more of our physicians will get um, education and training, you know, in, in behavior and vice versa. Um, because you're right. I mean, the source of behavior is the brain. So it's a natural connection. And how can we really understand behavior if we're not thinking about the brain? Um, so, you know, I, I was a, a pediatric neurologist first and then went back to school and got my BCBA um, just in the, 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 math, the last five years. And um, it's allowed me to develop and to, then to use in my practice and in the cortica clinics an approach that we call a neuro, neurobehavioral framework. And so it's taking everything that is really effective and positive about ABA and the behavioral approach and then taking it one level, what I consider sort of one level deeper, you know, then once we've identified behavior and we've uh, analyzed the environment and taken data and we understand based on that information, why behaviors are happening, then we can say, okay, what do we know about a child's unique neurodevelopment? What, we've know, what do we know about the way their brain processes information, sensory, motor, cognitive, language, um, social, emotional, and then that allows us to tailor the different antecedents, consequences, you know, the different aspects of the environment specifically to then shape that child's behavior and learning. So I think it's such a powerful combination. So it's more of like a, like a, like a customized approach rather than trying to apply a general rule or a general approach to what are usually very, very unique kids. That's exactly right. So do you see more, do you see more success with kids when that kind of approach is taken? I mean, it would make sense that you would. Yes. Is that sort of what translates to in real life? That's right. Very cool. Mm -hmm. Um, how did you, how did you get started doing this? Did you do like what, like what sparked your interest in working with kids? Yeah. Well, there were, you know, when I look back, um, there were a few experiences I had actually as a child that I think planted the seeds for what I do today and for Cortica. Um, one is that my father was a pediatrician, and so I grew up in Toledo, Ohio, and I just remember at that time, you know, the practice of medicine was different. He would have patients come to our home on nights, on weekends, and so it just felt like 
I just remember having such positive experiences seeing my dad take care of children. Um, and then another big part of it was uh, when I was a high school student, I volunteered as a camp counselor at a local summer camp for neurodivergent children. And that's, that was my first exposure to children, um, autistic children, uh, children with epilepsy, ADHD, spina bifida, um, a whole range of neurological differences. And what was one of the really incredible things at that camp was they paired a neurotypical camp counselor volunteer with a neurodivergent camp counselor volunteer. And my co-counselor happened to be a young man with cerebral palsy. And for me, that friendship was so powerful, seeing his intellect, his humor, um, recognizing um, what now I think of as really the beauty of neurodivergence. And so that was, that stayed with me. And so as I went through medical school um, and then later, of course, chose a residency and, and pursued that, um, yeah, it was just that those early experiences were really powerful for me. I think it's so cool when, when people have one of those kind of profound experiences early on in life and it sort of shapes the direction that they go in. And even if it was like, never thought about doing something like that necessarily until you you have this experience and it, and it kind of guides you or, or it's, it lights a fire sort of, yes. and, or even sort of fine tunes the direction that you were, you know, were looking to go in. That's very, very cool. Cause you guys have like a passion for what you do mm -hmm. and it's not like, um, yeah, I mean, there's, there's, well, there's a whole shortage of, of people doing what you do. So, yeah. I mean, you went through all the extra schooling and, and everything else. And I really appreciate that because like, I'm, I'm actually in Ohio too. I'm in Northeast Ohio. Um, and there's like a three-year wait list here for kids to be diagnosed. And we need as many people like you as we can possibly get to, to help uh, cut those lists down because there's like these, you know, the, the vital early years where we need intervention, uh, kids are on hold, mm -hmm. you know, because insurance won't cover things until you have an official diagnosis. And I was just talking to a mom the other day who, who has to wait like three years to, to get a diagnosis. Um, do you guys, do you guys do anything online? We do. And so we, what we've built out is what we call a hybrid program, meaning that we do, we provide services online through, you know, telehealth. So virtually mm -hmm. um, we provide um, in-center services, in-home in the community and in school. And the reason for providing this kind of hybrid care model is that different children and families have different needs. And so we really want to meet the child and the family where they're at and deliver the service in a way that is really customized for you know, what, what will, will best serve that child. Um, and the, the part that we have really been um, developing very actively, certainly during COVID um, and since is, is our telehealth offering, um, in part because we now, now know, and there's a lot of research to support it, that telehealth delivery of a whole set of different healthcare services for neurodevelopment is extremely effective. Even things like occupational therapy, speech language therapy, um, certainly parent education, you know, parent coaching part of ABA. Um, direct services for ABA are harder to do by telehealth. But if you have um, a motivated family, so much can be accomplished through um, uh, caregiver coaching. So we have um, a lot of all of our services now are available through telehealth, and it allows us to reach families, you know, in states and locations where Cortica doesn't have a center. But one of the things we're very excited about, and we'll be launching next year, is a whole is um, a full set of comprehensive care services for autism that can be done virtually, including diagnosis and all the different therapy services. Oh, wow. Yeah. Wow. That's really, that's really, really cool. I, I've seen that starting to pop up. I've not experienced what, what that's like, you know, virtually, but, but I think there is such a need for that, especially because there's a lot of people who live in, you know, the outskirts and, and they don't have those resources available to them and they have to go online or travel for hours to get, you know, somewhere. So that's, that's really, really cool. I'm excited to see how that. Yeah. And, and you know, the, the wait times, the, the lack of access to care is it for, for neurodevelop for autism and neurodevelopment more broadly, it's, there are the longest wait times of any medical specialty. And for me, that's, you know, I just think that's, um, it, it deserves so much more attention and effort because it, I think of it as a form of institutionalized discrimination. If that, you know, if the quality of care is poor and the access is poor and we know, and it's fragmented, 
you know, that is just, um, that's really something that has to change in our healthcare system. I completely agree with you. Completely agree with you. I hear from parents everywhere uh, about just the frustration with trying to navigate the system and, and kids not getting the care that they need or, uh, you know, maybe even doctors not having the training that they need mm-hmm. to, to, to really kind of dig in and help with some of these uh, challenges. So I, I completely agree with you. I'm, I'm very much looking forward to seeing you guys launch that uh, because I think that'll be a great resource for, for a lot of people. Yes. This episode is brought to you by Mightier. Mightier is a biofeedback-based video game platform that teaches kids to emotionally self-regulate. This leads to a significant reduction in meltdowns and parental stress. It's backed by science out of Harvard Medical and Boston Children's and has helped over 100,000 kids. For more information, visit theautismdad.com forward slash mightier. That's theautismdad.com forward slash M-I-G-H-T-I-E-R and use the code theautismdad22 to save 10%. Um, one thing we wanted to touch on today was the comorbid diagnoses and, you know, some of the ones that, that I'm familiar with that I hear a lot about or I've dealt with, with my kids, uh, you know, we have epilepsy, a lot of sensory related stuff and ADHD is a big one. And I guess I was wondering if you could kind of talk a little bit about what some of the common comorbid diagnoses are and then how, you know, how, you know, one can impact the other because sometimes like symptoms overlap and it's really hard to kind of tease out like what's anxiety versus what's ADHD or what's Mm -hmm. just autism and what's, you know, whatever. So can we just talk a little bit about, you know, what your experience is with, with dealing with comorbid? Yes. Why it's so important to understand these comorbid or co-occurring features or diagnoses is because they can actually affect a person's health quality of life, learning, well-being, even more than the the features of autism itself. So we know that these are extremely common. About 90, well, an estimated 90% of autistic individuals have at least one co-occurring condition, and 50% have four or more. So these are incredibly common. The way I like to think about them is in different categories. So the first category being medical. So the most common medical co-occurring conditions are Um, Genetic and metabolic conditions, those are present in about 20 to 30 percent. Epilepsy, around 20 percent. Sleep disturbance or sleep disorders, close to 80 percent. And then gastrointestinal symptoms and disorders, close to 90 percent. And then the the last big category would be um, sort of uh, immune, you know, immune disorders or dysfunction. And then um, also a category called autonomic nervous system dysfunction. Um, and really? That's, are you familiar with the autonomic nervous system? Yes. Yeah. My, my oldest, when he was about, I don't know, he, he was about 11, I think, uh, he, he was getting his 72 hour EEG and on the way home from that evaluation, he crashed in the car and his heart rate, uh, went haywire. His blood pressure went haywire, his body temperature, and he went essentially unresponsive turn around, take him back to the hospital. And then after months of testing, uh, he was diagnosed at the Cleveland Clinic with, they never named it, but it was an autonomic dysfunction, sort of like POTS, but like an extreme version of POTS, where his brain would just stop controlling autonomic functions, like uh, his heart rate and his blood pressure and uh, even body temperature. He'd get these weird rashes that would start in one place and you could just watch it move all over his body. And he would be hospitalized for upwards of a week at times. And there was, it was all supportive care because there was no way for them. They didn't know how to stop it at the time. So so that's, um, is that, is that something that you see? Like those just mysterious kids that present in these weird ways that just people don't know what to do with? There's, well, we now know that they are connected. There's still a lot of research that needs to be done to figure out exactly what those mechanisms are and and it's probably, you know, complex in interactions of lots of genetic variables and certain environmental variables and, and that waxing and waning kind of presentation. Yes. I mean, there's so much we're still trying to figure out, but at least now we understand it is all connected and that these things are much more common in, in neurodivergent children and adults. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah. So I, that you just totally kind of blew my mind when you, when you said that, because you're the first person that I have talked to that has sort of connected those dots, uh, in some way. <laughs> and that was really kind of validating. Um, one of the things that I think parents struggle with is, is being taken seriously when it, when it comes to some of these things, because, you know, I hear from a lot of parents and even my own experience with my kids when they were younger is you, know, you take these symptoms that you're seeing at home and, and you take them to your care provider and they tend to want to just sort of sometimes anyways, lump everything under the autism diagnosis and just say, well, they're autistic. You know, you're going to have behaviors like this, or some of these things are going to happen. When in reality, there's there's actually a, another issue, or, or or there's a health concern. Is there, you know, how do you recommend parents um, advocate for, for the kids? You know, if they feel like they're not being taken seriously. Well, it's I would say what you just described is probably the biggest problem currently in in the field of you know healthcare for autism is that mm -hmm. there's a a mistake that a lot of professionals make, which is to attribute some symptom or some, you know, something that comes up, they'll say it's because of autism. Now that doesn't make any sense because the diagnosis of autism is just a descriptive one. It's just a collection of observations of, of characteristics. A, a diagnosis of autism doesn't speak at all to root causes or underlying biology. And so um, one example that I often give is if a child has self-injurious behavior, you would never, ever want to say, oh, that's because of autism. You need to look deeper. Is there a sensory processing difference? Is there a medical source of pain? Is there, you know, an autonomic nervous system response, a state of chronic stress that's contributing? Um, so you always have to look deeper. And if you're, if as a parent, if you're working with a, a professional who is attributing things to autism itself rather than looking deeper, you probably want to find someone else to partner with. And it can take time to find that team. Or, yeah, and to find a good fit, yeah. I think, too, because sometimes it's hard to find, um, it's hard to find a good fit. Yes. Uh, if you have, a, if you have a, a child that's diagnosed with autism, is there, I mean, is there a recommended, like, primary care practitioner, if that makes sense? Like, you have, like, your... You have your pediatrician to handle like all the everyday stuff, right? The nutrition and whatever. Uh, but do you, do you recommend, you know, for kids who are neurodivergent that they have a developmental or a, a pediatric neurologist to, to kind of handle the overarching sort of like autism related type things? You know, it will look, the team that will best, you know, support your child depends so much on kind of your local resources and the local expertise and interests and specialty of the different, you know, professionals in your area. So for some, um, and I know, you know, I'm here in San Diego, there are a lot of pediatricians in the community who are fantastic and who actually have a, quite a high level of knowledge about autism, are extremely open-minded, um, understand a lot of, even about nutrition and supplementation and how different lifestyle factors and exercise and different things influence development. So sometimes a general pediatrician can, can cover all those bases in addition to doing things like, you know, uh, if your child gets sick or has a fever or, you know, well child checks, those kinds of things. Um, but in, in other places, that's harder to find. And so you may then uh, want to look for specialists. And um, sometimes that specialist is a pediatric neurologist. Sometimes it's a child psychiatrist. Sometimes the psychologist it just depends. I wish, you know, parents will often ask me, is there a particular type of professional or a label, you know, or a degree that will tell me that this person's going to be right for my child? And unfortunately, right now there isn't. So it really is about exploring, getting to know the resources, talking to other parents, and then trying, trying it out and seeing if that person uh, aligns with the way that, that you think about your child and, and the type of care that you want your child to have. And well, I think it's, I think that's very well put. And, and you know, we've been very lucky. Well, I've been very lucky with my kids, and and our pediatricians have been very, they are very knowledgeable, and they're they're like huge team players. So so we've had this like huge support team with Cleveland Clinic and Akron Children's, and you know, a dozen different doctors and various different specialties, and they all you know work together and share records and keep on touch with everything, and and that's been very very helpful, especially with that complex uh, medical needs. Um. So I, you know, I always just tell parents, like, if you, similar to what you said, like if, if, you know, you have questions, 
you know, speak up. If you don't feel you're being taken seriously, speak up. If you're still not taken seriously, get a second opinion or find a different doctor. Yeah. You know, I mean, not everybody's going to be the best fit for, for what you're doing. And you are your child's best advocate, you know, and don't be afraid to speak up. You know, I think sometimes parents are a little bit intimidated and don't mm -hmm. feel like they can do that. Mm -hmm. um, I, I wanted to also uh, touch on your book, uh, uh, Magnificent Minds, because I think it just it just came out like a week ago. Yes. Yeah. One week ago. Awesome. Can you talk a little bit about uh, Magnificent Minds? Sure. So uh, Magnificent Minds, uh, the, the full title of the book is Magnificent Minds, The New Whole Child Approach. And uh, I wrote this book because, you know, I've been practicing now close to 25 years and have always wanted a book that I could recommend to parents that I felt would give them all of the essential information. I think of it as like liquid gold, you know, something that could be manageable for parents, really easy to understand that they could get through um, in the course of their busy schedule. And that would be relevant whether their child was newly diagnosed or if they've been on the journey, you know, for many years. And um, I never, I was never able to find that book. And so I, that, that was a big part of what inspired me to write Magnificent Minds. Um, and what, what the book offers is um, what I call the whole child path. So it really is intended as a roadmap, you know, something that will equip and empower caregivers. And I also think you know, I wanted something that would be energizing and uplifting to, to help um, really set them on the right course um, as they're, they're wanting to bring the best care for their children. So it covers everything from, you know, uh, medical therapies, testing, um, pharmacological interventions, device-based therapies, and then also reviews mental health strategies and all the different developmental and behavioral approaches for autism. And yeah, it's, it's, it's my attempt to try to bring everything together. And it and there it's like practical. So so it's not like um, outrageously complex or, you know, because I think a lot of times parents get like you know homework to do with their kids or whatever, and and it's just not it's not realistic. And you know, being able to to focus on that that whole child and kind of attack things from multiple different angles is, is good for any kid, right? Because good nutrition is good for any kid. Good mental health is good for any kid. But you can you can apply mm -hmm. these things to your everyday life which I think is really important because a lot of times parents get lost and they get overwhelmed mm -hmm. and they don't know what to do. And, you know, it's like people, when they talk about self-care, it's, it's frustrating because a lot of times people are promoting, like you have to go get a massage or you gotta go on vacation and self-care can literally be anything that is positive for you. That's not self-destructive, that is sustainable and, and puts back into you. Right. And, and having that sort of, um, the approach that you take with this makes it attainable and accessible to people. So mm -hmm. I just thought that was really, I wanted to point that out because I thought that was really cool. Uh, I do have my copy. I couldn't find it though. I put it somewhere today thinking I'm going to set it down so I know where it is. <laughs> and then I, I'll find it as soon as we're done. Um, but very, very good. Very, very good. And we'll have all the links in the show notes because uh, it's on Amazon, right? Yes. So mm -hmm. I'll have all those links. What is, what is the best way for parents to connect with you? Well, um, my, uh, they can find a lot of information on Cortica's website. It's CorticaCare, okay. C-O-R-T-I-C-A-C-A-R-E.com. Okay. Um, and they can contact Cortica that way and send, I'll get messages. And, you know, our staff will forward me many messages. I also have a website, um, drsuzanego.com. Um, they can message me that way. And uh, Instagram. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Yeah. I'll, I'll have all those links uh, in the show notes and in the blog post uh, for this, I'll tag you guys in the promotional social media stuff so people can connect with you. I, as a parent, I really appreciate how accessible uh, you are and, and, and being open to hearing uh, from parents because there are so many people out there who are so desperate and just, they feel like they're drowning and you, you don't know, maybe, maybe you do, but like sometimes it's that one person who, you know, is accessible to you, who is willing to just listen or connect with you or, or point you in a direction that makes all the difference in the world mm -hmm. and sort of restores that hope. And you get that strength to kind of get back up and, and move forward a little bit more. And I just thank you for doing everything that you're doing. I, I really appreciate it. Thank you. It's um, sometimes people ask me how, you know, what was the origin of the whole child approach? And really it was because 
of listening to the questions parents brought to me. And where I didn't have the answers, I would do my reading, I would do my research. And so I was really guided by the parents that I worked with and have learned, I mean, I've learned more from the parents and the children in my practice than I have from anyone. So um, it's, it's wonderful to hear that it's, um, the book is resonating and yeah. Thank you. Oh yeah. Well, thank, thank you for everything. And uh, I'll have all that information so people can connect with you and check out your book and uh, find some help if they, if they need help. Thank you so much. So uh, thank you again for your time. I really appreciate it. And uh, we'll talk to you soon. Thank you. Before we go, I just wanted to take a moment and say thank you so much for taking the time to tune in and for all the support you guys have shown me over the last seven seasons. I am so grateful and appreciative of each and every one of you. If you have found this useful or you just enjoyed listening, if you wouldn't mind taking a moment to leave a review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify or whatever app you're listening to this on or share it with your friends or whatever, uh, it's a great way to support the show. Thank you. I really appreciate it. You guys can reach me at the autismdad.link. That's the autismdad.link. And we'll talk soon. Thanks. Bye.